Russell's new collection of short stories, a permanent member of the family, explores the lives of men and women confronting crisis and change. The settings are places the author knows well, upstate New York and South Florida. And just like the locales, the characters in the stories are uniquely and lovingly created. A former Marine facing poverty becomes a serial bank robber until he's discovered by his sons. A woman loses her husband after the couple become snowbirds buying a condo in Florida, only to be surprised and confused at the freedom and happiness that follows death. These are stories that resonate after the book has been put down, stories that evoke the strangeness and complexity of human lives. We're glad you came, and uh, we're glad that Russell is here. So please help me welcome Russell Banks. Thank you. I'm glad to be here. It's very nice to be here um, again. Um, I, I have to begin by um, warning you, I'm, I'm traveling with a cold uh, bearing down on me. And, and every now and then my voice kind of squeezes tight and, uh, and I lose it and I reach for a lozenge or in this case a cup of tea with some honey. So I think I'll get through this okay, but, um, but it has uh, occasionally ended up um, making, me, making my voice go up a half a dozen registers and start to sque squeal instead of speak. But I, I, I won't, don't think that'll happen tonight. Um, it's been a, I'm, I'm doing this sort of uh, book tour. It's a kind of a mini tour this time. Um, and um, it's been a pleasure for me to read from this book. Usually when I'm, I'm the last decade or so, I've been reading from a novel when I've been you know, traveling around and visiting bookstores and so forth. And it's much di more difficult to read from a novel, to find a, a passage, uh, an excerpt that makes sense in its own terms and has a shapeliness to it that if you're sitting here for 20 minutes or so, you can kind of follow it and not have to have it explained in great detail um, and at length. Um, whereas a story kind of self-contained, one hopes, and, and has a beginning and a middle and an end, one hopes, and, um, and is over in about 20 minutes, one hopes. And, um, and so um, it, has a, 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 it lends itself to this kind of a presentation in a way that a novel doesn't. So it's been, for me, a pleasure to be able to, to, uh, to do this. Also, it's been, it was a pleasure for me to write these stories. Um, I had written in a row three novels without writing any short stories. In the past, I used to kind of intersperse the writing of a novel with the occasional writing of a story, and then a decade or maybe eight years would go by, and then I'd go back and look at all the stories I had written, and I'd go through with them and say, which ones do I want to pull together into a collection and make a book out of? Um, which I think is more typical of what most fiction writers do who write both novels and short stories. But at the end, at the, at this last decade, uh, really since 2001, I hadn't written any short stories. I had just written novels. I wrote three novels in a row. And two of them were especially, I can't say that, all three of them <laughs> were draining and, and, and exhausting in their own way. And, and at the end of the last one, Lost Memory of Skin, I felt that I was kind of burnt out and remembered that, you know, when you write short stories, those of you who do write both novels and short stories, I think, understand this, it seems as though you're writing them from a different part of the brain than that part of the brain that writes the novels. Um, it's maybe a part of the brain that writes songs or poems or does math or something like that, something a little more abstract and a little more formal and structured and a little more contained and maybe even a little more objective um, than is available to you when you're writing novels. When you write novels, you, you live in that space, in that time frame, and in that world for years. It becomes almost a substitute world or an alternative world for you. Uh, and you don't really have a sense of it from outside uh, until the very end and you're revising it and by the fourth or fifth or sixth revision, you might begin to get a grasp of it from the outside. But in the process, you don't process of writing it. Whereas with a short story, you tend to have that sense of being a little bit outside. And, um, and you can, when you get to the end of the story, still remember the beginning of the story. And so that you can make them chime, you can make a rhyme, you can make an echo, so that the meaning of the last paragraphs and so forth will take on greater resonance and depth and, 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 and clarity because you can remember the beginning. Whereas with a novel, it's actually the opposite. You know, you, you, you'll, you'll notice, I'm sure, if you get 70 pages into a novel or so, I think it's around page 70, at least for me it is, I can't remember the beginning anymore. 
and I don't know where it started. I don't know who was there. I don't know what scene it was or anything, unless it was some gigantic, tricky scene, and the author actually put it in there so I would remember. And then it's kind of flawed at the, the novel in a way. Um, there's a different relation to time um, between short stories and novels. Where uh, I think a novel has a kind of mnemonic relation to time because if you notice. Um, um, in your own life, you can't remember the beginning at around page 70, um, which is about the age of two. Um, from there back, you don't remember. You know, you can only re you're lucky if you can remember from page two, from age two forward, page 70 forward. Uh, so the flow of time is imitated in a novel in a way it's not in a short story. And a short story, in a way, steps outside of time and um, has a rather different relation, I think, entirely to time. It's a moment that implies a past, but only implies it. It implies a future, um, but doesn't narrate it, merely implies it, and establishes itself as a shift between the two, as a change occurring somewhere in that moment, or two, or three. But it's not the flow of time that a novel establishes for us. Anyhow, I'll say that all as preface, and as a way of describing the pleasure that it gave me to parked the novel writing and that brain that wrote novels and, and, and shut it down for a rest time and turned to writing short stories, um, which felt, you know, really in a kind of phenomenological way, very different than, than writing novels. And, and, um, and so there you go. This book is the result of that period, that 18-month uh, that, that, that period or so. So I'd like to read to you a story um, which is not set in the uh, Adirondacks and not set in South Florida, but it's set in New England, uh, and, and it, it's about a guy from Troy, so maybe that has uh, some connection to uh, the Adirondacks. And it about, takes about 20 minutes or so to read, and, and then I would be very happy to... Um, to let you kind of lead me in, in a discussion of any subject you would like to, to lead me toward. Um, but this story is called Transplant. Oh, before I do, let me just do one thing further, which has kind of been fun for me on this. I, I, what I did in order to write this book was go back over my notebooks for the previous, I, know, some, I think I went back about 15 years, or I keep little notebooks like most writers, and write down little sketches or notes or thoughts that might someday be something. You never know, um, and usually you don't pay attention. And then, um, but in this case, I sat down, I went back over my notes, and I pulled out 12 that became the stories. Um, and I'll read you a couple of them, just so you give us some idea of what generated some of these stories, the kind of thing, because they differ. Sometimes it's just a, an episode, sometimes it's a, um, an image, and sometimes it's a, a little uh, event, and so on. Here's one. Um, Man goes to academic literary Christmas party with new wife at ex-wife's house. <laughs> well, some of you been there? Is that, <laughs> is that the case? I, the laughter of familiarity. Man steps outside to smoke, etc. Views party through windows, full moon, snow, etc. Sees Latina nanny in dining room alone with new adopted African baby of hosts. Man decides he wants to hold the baby, goes into the living room with fireplace, Christmas tree, while holding infant suddenly realizes he is drunker than he thought and drops the baby. All right. That became a story called Christmas Party. And a lot of these things dropped out of it and other things entered it, but that was what was the skeleton that began it. And he didn't drop the baby. I'll let you know that. Um, um, let's see. Story about a woman whose marriage is busted, putting her life into a storage unit. I have a storage unit, and, and uh, I, I put stuff into and store it, as many of you probably do, or some of you do. Uh, the stuff you can't keep in your house is just too much, and you never want to use it, and your kids aren't ready for it. Um, and I was there one time putting some boxes into it, and I saw a woman drive up in her little Mazda, and she was probably about 35 years old, and attractive young woman and she was unloading from her little Mazda car with a trunk up all these kind of like kitchen things like a microwave and, and stuff you wouldn't be storing unless your marriage or your domestic relationship were collapsing and she was doing and she had tears she'd clearly been crying in the morning it was midday or so and I said oh yeah, yeah, yeah. there's a whole 
there's a whole story there. That, that, you know, that was the note that ended up there, and it, it became a small part of a larger story uh, called Snowbirds. Um, and then I'll read you one more, which is kind of maybe amusing. I don't know. Some of them are a little longer than others, but this is a relatively short one, I think. Um, story about a... This is actually... This became the title story. Uh, permanent member of the family. Story about a family dog given in divorce to custody of the husband, father. Beloved old family dog. It's run over accidentally by the father with the kids in the car. Have to bury the dog. It's winter. Ground is frozen. Story is about anger. Duh. <laughs> the kids anger at the father and the father's guilt for having abandoned his kids. And the dog is a sacrificial victim. You know, that was a note that I made you know, many years ago that ended up as the key to, well, as a skeleton for the story that became the title story. Anyhow, um, this one, I'll, I'll tell you after I read the story what the origins of this particular story were. It's called Transplant. Can you hear me all right, by the way, up back? Because I have no sense of the mic's power. Okay, good. The crushed gravel footpath wound uphill from the parking lot through a grove of poplar trees. From the passenger seat of the van, Howard spotted the monument at the top of the hill, a head-high granite pylon that marked the site of a Puritan massacre of a band of Narragansett Indians. He made out the slender figure of a woman standing next to the pylon. She wore jeans and a bright yellow nylon poncho with the hood up. He turned to the woman in the driver's seat and said, I don't know, Betty. It's farther than I usually walk, you know. Can't turn back now, she said. She reached across him and opened his door and handed his cane to him. It's not so far. She's waiting for you. Maybe you could go up and bring her down here instead. Maybe you could pretend she doesn't exist and go sit at the porch in the house like an invalid and watch the sunset over the harbor. You need the exercise, Howard. Besides, you set this up. This is your deal. No, it's Dr. Horowitz's deal, he said. He grabbed his cane and eased himself from the van. The whole thing is crazy, he thought. I am an invalid. I need to be left alone. This woman shouldn't bring her troubles to me. I've got enough of my own. He stood unsteadily for a few seconds, then squared his shoulders and slowly made his way up the path toward the woman in the yellow poncho. This was not how he had expected the day to play out. Around ten that morning, Betty had entered his bedroom without knocking as usual and had drawn back the curtains and let sunlight flood the room. From his bed, Howard saw the sloping meadow below and then the harbor and the long, low peninsula on the far side, the white steeple of the church and the colonial-era waterside houses and docks of the fishing village, and his irritation, as usual, passed. Let's check the vitals, Betty said. See if you're ready for a walk in the park today. Doctor's orders. She pushed up his pajama sleeve and began taking his blood pressure. She was an abrupt, pink, square-faced woman with graying, straw-colored hair cut in a page boy with Prince Valiant bangs. Her hair looked ridiculous to Howard. She was in her mid-forties, a few years younger than he. After some initial difficulty, they had become friends. Her short, athletic body was attractive, but in a masculine way that was not sexy to him, and he was glad of that. Relieved is more like it. Betty treated him as if he were an adolescent boy, but he felt like a very old man locked in an even older man's body. He liked her crisp, no-nonsense personality and her bark of a laugh when he resisted her attempts to get him up and moving or make him follow his strict diet, drink eight glasses of water a day, walk in the house without a cane. A certain degree of irritation gave him pleasure. Her refusal to treat him the way he felt, along with the daily sight of the harbor and the marina and town on the other side of it, cheered him. Very little else cheered him, however. 
You got a phone call to make, she said, and stuck the thermometer under his tongue. Dr. Anthea Horowitz wants to talk to you. What kind of name is that anyhow, Anthea? She's Jewish, right? She pulled out the thermometer, checked it, and shook it down. 97.9. BP is 130 over 78. You're still functional, Howard. I don't know. Scandinavian, maybe. Could be Jewish, I guess. How many times have you asked me about her name, anyhow? You got a problem with Jewish women doctors? Give me the damn phone, he said. She passed him the telephone. Don't forget your morning meds, she said, and pointed to the glass of water and plastic cup of pills on the bedside table. Breakfast in 15, mister. More like brunch, actually, she noted, and headed for the kitchen. Since he'd left the hospital, every morning had been the same. He knew at once where he was and why, but couldn't remember exactly how he had got there. It wasn't the painkillers. He'd been off them for five weeks, almost. It had to be the residue of the anesthesia. They say it takes a month for every hour you're anesthetized before you're normal, and he'd been knocked out for eight and a half hours. He did the math again. It was mid-May. The operation had been January 6th. He wouldn't be clear of the effects of the anesthesia until September. There were still large blank patches in his memory that shifted locale daily unpredictably. Every morning when he woke, he remembered suddenly something that the day before he'd been unable to recall, his cell phone number or the name of his daily newspaper. Then an hour or two later, he'd notice a batch of new blanks. He couldn't remember the brand of car he owned, his social security number, the name of the mysterious leafy green vegetable in the refrigerator. The patch over his move in March from the hospital to his ex-mother-in-law's summer house had stayed, however, week after week, month after month. He had no memory of the actual event, and that worried him. Howard knew the facts. He had been told them by his ex-wife, Janice, and her mother, and by his surgeon, Dr. Horowitz, and his nurse, Betty O'Hara and could pass that information on to anyone who wanted to know why he was living alone in a seaside summer cottage on Cohasset Harbor. The explanation was simple. He couldn't return to his own house in Troy, New York, because he had undergone the transplant in Boston and had to stay nearby, monitored by Dr. Horowitz and her staff while recovering from the surgery. Betty tested his blood daily and drove him to Boston weekly to be examined for telltale signs of rejection or infection. His insurance, although it covered Betty's salary, wouldn't pay for an apartment or house in the area. And he was currently unemployed. He had been a publisher's representative, basically a traveling salesman for the Northeast region, a job he was no longer capable of holding. He had fallen on hard times, as he liked to say. Luckily, drawing from some half-filled well of residual affection, his ex-wife had talked her mother into giving him the use of her summer house. He knew all that, although he couldn't remember actually moving in, taking up residence. He had no problem remembering Dr. Horowitz's office number, however. In the last year, while waiting for an available heart, he had called her office hundreds of times and dozens of times since the surgery. He sat up in bed and dialed and told the receptionist that he was returning a call from Dr. Horowitz. A few seconds later, she came on the line. Howard? Yes, hello. How are you feeling this week, Howard? She sounded tentative to him, less assured than usual. Not a good sign. Okay, I guess. No complaints. Why, anything wrong with my tests? No, no, no. Everything's hunky-dory. I'm sorry to bother you. I'm not bothering you, am I? Can you talk? Yeah, sure. What's up, Doc? If she could say everything was hunky-dory, he could call her Doc. (laughs) Howard, I'm passing on a request. Not a usual request, but one I have to honor. You understand? Yeah, sort of. The wife... The widow of the man who donated your heart? My heart. Yes. She wants to meet you. They were both silent for a moment. Christ. She wants to meet me? 
Yes. Why? I haven't given her your contact information. I can't do that without your permission. I only agreed to convey her request, that's all. Why, though? Why does she want to meet me? I don't think... I'm not sure I can handle that. I understand, Howard. I know you've been depressed. That's not unusual. I can prescribe something for it, you know. It's not like the heart's adopted and she's the birth mother. <laughs> it's up to you. It's not all that uncommon, you know. What, being depressed after a heart transplant? That too. But no, the donor wanting to meet the recipient. She's not the donor, he said. All he knew about his heart before it became his was that it had belonged to a 26-year-old man who had died of head injuries suffered in a motorcycle accident. The man, a roofer in New Bedford, had been married, the father of a very young child, and a non-smoker, Dr. Horowitz had assured him. Howard placed his right hand onto his heart and felt its sturdy beat. It's my heart, damn it. it belongs to Howard Bloom, not some poor kid who fell off his motorcycle, hit his head on a curb, and died. He said, I've got to think about it. Of course. She says she'll meet you anywhere you want. She's young, barely 22, and I take it she's alone in the world, except for her baby boy. My guess is she still hasn't accepted the death of her husband, hasn't found closure. It's not unusual. Closure? I don't know the meaning of the word, he said. He was thinking of his divorce from Janice seven years ago, the end of a brief but perfect marriage, a marriage ruined by the affairs and dalliances that had resulted from his refusal to come in off the road and live and work close to home, maybe run a bookstore, turn himself into a domesticated man, a faithful husband because watched, a secure husband because watchful. But he'd spent 20 years on the road before falling in love with Janice and after marrying her continued sleeping five nights a week away from home. Howard believed that he had married too late when he was too old to change his ways. He was attractive to women in spite of being a cold and selfish man. And he had betrayed Janice frequently. And finally Janice had betrayed him back and had fallen in love with one of her lovers, and now she was married to him and had two children with him, and that was that. When a terrible thing happens and it's your own damn fault, there's no closure, he thought. Whatever happened, you live with it. Alone, he had endured three heart attacks, an open-heart bypass surgery, and a year later the steady deterioration of the organ itself, and now the transplant. All of it somehow the result of his having ruined his marriage to Janice, the one truly good thing that had befallen him. He believed that none of it, the heart attacks, the surgery, the transplant, would have happened if it hadn't been for the divorce. It was a superstition, he knew, but he couldn't let it go. This young woman, though, had not caused her husband's accident, the terrible thing that had happened to her. It was her husband's fault. Maybe for her, closure, whatever that meant, was possible. I guess I owe her a lot, right? I mean, she's the one who made the decision to donate his organs. Dr. Horowitz asked where he would like to meet the woman. Her name was Penny McDonough, she said, from New Bedford, less than an hour's drive from his cottage on Cohasset Harbor. I don't want her to come here, he said. I'll ask Betty where's a good place nearby, some place she can drive me to. I'll get back to you and set a time, he said. Tell her that I'm only good for a short visit. He neared the monument at the top of the hill, breathing hard, leaving, leaning heavily on his cane, his heart pounding. Whose heart was it, anyhow? Dear God, whose heart is inside me? It was not his own, but it was not someone else's either. Until this moment, Howard had managed not to ask that question. Now, since agreeing to meet this woman, he couldn't stop asking it, and he knew why he had avoided it for so long. There was no answer to the question, none. He was afraid 
that for the rest of his life he would not be able to say whose heart was keeping him alive. He walked to the side of the monument where the woman in the yellow poncho stood waiting. She was very slender, fragile-seeming, almost childlike, with small hands and thin, bony wrists, young enough to be his daughter, he thought. Instead of a woman's purse, she held a green cloth book bag. She had pale skin and large blue eyes and wore no makeup or jewelry that he could see. Short wisps of coppery hair crossed her forehead, and he remembered her name, Penny, and wondered what her real name was, not Penelope. Probably something Irish, he thought. I'm Howard Bloom, he said. I guess you're Penny? Mrs. McDonough, I mean? He extended his right hand, and she gave him hers, cold and half the size of his. Yes. Thank you, Mr. Bloom, for agreeing to meet with me. She had a flattened South Shore accent. She looked directly at his eyes, but not into them, as if she had met him once long ago and was trying to remember where. I'm sorry you had to walk all the way up here from the car, she said. I wasn't sure it was you or I'd have come down. That's okay. I needed the exercise. She made a tight-lipped smile. Because of the surgery, yes. Are you all right? I mean... Yes, I'm fine, he said, cutting her off. Listen, this is kind of uncomfortable for me. But I did want to be able to tell you how grateful I am for what you did. I don't know why you wanted to meet me, but that's why I wanted to meet you. To tell you, to thank you. You don't have to thank me. It's what Steve, my husband, it's what he would have wanted. Yeah, well, I guess I should thank him too. He paused for a moment. He must have been a good guy. Thoughtful, right? She drew her bag in front of her as if about to open it. Yes. I have a favor I'd like to ask you, she said. May I? Yeah, sure. Why not? I want to listen to your heart. Steve's heart. Jesus. <laughs> Listen to my heart? That's, I mean, isn't that a little weird? It would mean a lot to me, more than you can know. Please, just once, just this one time. She opened the bag and, and withdrew a black and silver stethoscope and extended it as if it were an offering. I don't know. It feels a little creepy to me. You can understand that, can't you? Howard looked down the hill toward the car. He didn't want Betty to see this. He didn't want anyone to see this. A few yards beyond the parking lot, the narrow road followed the rock-strewn shore. A thickening bank of clouds had blotted out the sun, and an offshore wind had raised a chop in the blue-gray water. Please? She said in a low voice, please let me do this. She pushed back her hood and laid the curved rubber-tipped ends of the stethoscope over her shoulders and around her neck. Howard said nothing. He merely nodded, and she placed the tips into her ears and stepped toward him. Will you undo your shirt? He pulled his flannel shirt loose of his trousers and unbuttoned it all the way down. Why the hell am I letting her do this? I could just refuse and walk away, he thought. What about my T-shirt, he asked. Want me to lift it up? No, she said firmly. I don't want to see it. The chest piece at the end of the stethoscope was the size and shape of a small biscuit, and swiftly, as if she'd rehearsed, the young woman placed it directly over the incision in Howard's chest. Then she closed her eyes and listened. Tears ran down her cheeks. Howard put his arms around her shoulders and drew her closer to him and felt himself shudder and knew that he was weeping, too. Several moments passed, and then the woman removed the tips of the stethoscope from her ears and pressed the left side of her head against Howard's chest. They stood together for a long time, buffeted by the wind off the harbor, holding each other, listening to Howard's heart. The light rain had started falling. In the parking lot below, Betty walked around the front of the van, 
checked her watch and gazed up at the couple. After a few seconds, she walked back to the driver's side, got into the vehicle, and continued to wait. So there's Howard and Betty and <laughs> Penny and Steve's heart <laughs> and Dr. Horowitz in the background. Anyhow, I'll tell you where that story originated because it, it is, uh, for those of you who do write stories know this often happens. It was just an image. I was uh, visiting my mother-in-law, uh, my present wife, not my ex-wife's mother, and uh, unlike Howard, and, uh, in, which is on uh, Narragansett Bay in Rhode Island, and um, Little Compton, a little town down there. And I was out driving one morning, a kind of bleary fall morning, um, kind of rainy and gray, and the way New England seaside towns can get sometimes. And I stopped and I turned around and I looked up um, on a hillside where there was indeed a, a, a pylon with a little plaque that noted there was a massacre of 500 Narragansett Indians there in the 17th century and so on. That was all. And I suddenly had a vision. It wasn't an actual, you know, there wasn't anyone there, but I suddenly saw a woman, a young woman, a thin little young woman uh, in a yellow poncho um, and an older man holding her. And the older man was not her father and not a spouse. Um, and it was just a kind of sudden flash of imagery. And I have no idea where it came from. I may once have seen something like that and then you know, displaced it onto this particular piece of geography. Who knows? Uh, the images come to you the way they do in dreams. Um, and so there it is. You just take it. And I, and I noted it down in my book and, and my notebook. I said, that would be an interesting scene, but I have no idea what it means or how those two people got there. How did that woman, that young woman, get there in that yellow poncho and that man get there in a flannel shirt um, and jeans, uh, older man in his late 40s or 50s. How did he get there? And so on. So that was just what lay there for these several years that went by. And so that was why the story opens with that scene. I didn't know where it was going or how, who he was or that he had a heart transplant or anything. But, but it was that scene, that image. And then you know, the story will unfold as you unpack it. And I know, you know, I know, I see. Stan Plumley and a few others, and we write poetry here, you know, you know that's how poems begin sometimes too. Oh wait, just an image, and then you begin to understand, try in the writing how you can understand it. Well, let me see, we have some time, so I'd love to take questions if anyone has any they would like to uh, me to address. I would be delighted to let you guys take over the, the, the program in a way. Anybody wanna steer me in some direction? Oh, there you go, okay. okay. Uh, at the end of The Angel on the Roof, yeah. you discussed the how you felt about writing short stories and what they were and how you felt about novels and what they were. And you also said that you started out as a poet, but mm -hmm. that didn't quite work out. And one of the things you talked about in the short story and write, in, in writing is, um, I think, the pace at which the story is told and the condensing of the story, and it was like a passion. Mm. And you said something about the novel was like, a marriage. <laughs> it was long distance, yeah. in it for the long term, etc. Yeah. Uh, One can be passionate, though, about a marriage, too. I mean, yes, but it was. <laughs> I don't think the, the break was there between yeah. the two. Anyway. I think I, I may have it, referred it, to it as a dalliance <laughs> <laughs> versus so, a marriage. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so, I guess the, the question, I guess, is when you're writing a short story, mm. where your mind goes when you're writing a novel where your mind goes, mm. and you find sometimes that in your novels, a section of the novel is actually, could be a standalone story, and that sometimes when stories get put together, they can almost be a novel. Mm. So and I guess the, is the mental process that you have in going through the writing of the, of the short story and the writing of the novel, and then you said there's a long gap in which you were doing novels and not short stories, mm. and why, the, why that mm. gap? Well, I don't feel uh, the problem um, with regard to confusing um, the beginnings of and the actual writing of a short story with the possibility that it might turn into a novel or vice versa, that a section of a novel might turn into a short story. It seems the, the, the short story is so much uh, more dependent upon your understanding its formal structure and 
in reality, in a way, almost in, uh, before you get to the content in some sense. And, um, and that's not the case with a novel. It's quite the opposite. And you know, maybe by accident you look at a novel and you say, well, there's a piece that could be a short story. And it's probably a problem in the novel, a flaw in the novel, if that's the case. That you can understand that 40 or 30, 20 or 30 pages or whatever it is outside the context of the novel. You know, you shouldn't be able to understand it without its linkage to all the other parts in the novel. Um, so uh, I've, I've not run into that problem. I have once, I, uh, one time I started what I thought was a short story and I did write it out. Um, I, I had been writing a long novel for about three years. It, it turned out to be six years. In the end, it was, kind of, uh, it was Cloud Splitter, which is a very long novel, about a thousand pages. And I had gotten halfway through it or so, and I got bogged down in it. And it's a 19th century historical novel, and, um, and it dealt with an incredible complicated set of uh, materials and, um, and narrative. And so... Um, I decided I'd, I'd just take a break and, and write a short story. I had been watching all these kids in malls. This was in the 1997, and I'd seen all these kids hanging out in the malls in upstate New York that were kind of like blank-eyed and would avert their gaze if I looked at them, and I would avert my gaze if they looked at me, and there was this kind of sense of mutual alienation. And I started trying to pay attention to them and figure out who they were. And so I wrote a story that was about a kid who got kicked out of his house. Um, uh, Double wide trailer in a town, oh, Sable Forks, upstate New York. And I finished it and I said, gee, I wonder what happened to the kid after he got kicked out of the house. And so then I wrote, I realized there's more to this. And then I went on and it became a novel called Rule of the Bone. But that's the only time where I've ever actually written what I thought was going to be a story and it turned into a novel. Um, otherwise, it's been very clear to me from the very beginning that I was doing one or the other. And, and I've never had any confusion about that. Now, uh, and, I, and when I was teaching, too, I used to try to tell my students, say, look, a, short, a novel is not a long story. It's not a story that kept going. And a short story is not a piece of a novel. They're different animals altogether, different species altogether. And uh, you, you're much closer to writing poetry when you're writing short stories, I think, than, than, um, than you are writing novels. Uh, when you're writing novels, you're, you're closer to writing opera or something like that. So, you know, grand opera. <laughs> Yes, hi. Hi. Um, you say that when you write a short story, there's an implied past as well as an implied future. Can you elaborate on that idea? Well, it seems to me that, that um, stories do come down to fairly simple elements. Um, a conflict. Um, he wants something. She doesn't want to give it to him. Let's say a divorce. Um, and, um, and then... Um, there's a history implied just in that little conflict setup, right? Past, marriage. Um, and then it gets complicated, um, let's say, and this is where the action begins. Um, she um, turns out to be having a love affair. So that complicates the, the stasis, the static conflict. Conflicts are essentially static. Equally opposite forces are operating. He wants something, he can't get it. She wants something, she can't get it. It's, just, it's balanced. And then you complicate it. Oh, you throw, throw a monkey wrench into it. She's having a love affair. Then the action begins. And the action leads to change in the characters, inevitably. I mean, almost all stories break down this way uh, to this rather simple, it's very simple-minded, too, formula. But um, but that's how they do break down. I mean, the, the, the structure of a story breaks down that way. So the, the future uh, that's implied um, comes at the end. I mean, you know at the end of this little story, Howard's a slightly different guy. You know, he's not a softy anymore. He's not going to be a nice guy. And he's still going to quarrel every morning, you know, with Betty and this, that, and the other. But his heart is his now. You know, something happened when standing up there on that hill with that girl. And he changed over that moment. It brought him forward. She brought him out in a way. So he's got a different future than he had when he goes back to Troy by himself. He may even make peace with his ex-wife. We don't know. But there's something there still lingering between the two. He doesn't have closure. He may be able to get closure now. He didn't believe in closure before. He thought it was punishment. So he's changed over the course of these few pages. And that's his future. The past, you can see what kind of guy he was. You know, you know he was, as he says himself, you know, he was a cold and selfish man before that. 
So there is this. Uh, so I think stories are, are most adept at doing that. They do many things, and there are different kinds of stories, of course. I mean, I, I adore the form and and the masters of the short story. You know, show us how variable it can be. And I'm being oversimplistic in describing it this way. I realize. But there are a few things you can kind of identify, I think, in that way. I don't know if that answers your question or not, but quite. <laughs> I can tell it doesn't quite answer it, but <laughs> I tried. Okay, maybe in some other question I'll come back around and say something that will. Someone else? <laughs> yes, in the back, yeah. Oh, sure, and, and I'm only guessing. You know, I, I'm only a, a, a reader just like anybody else. Uh, I don't have any special dispensation uh, or even or access to the story because I happen to have written it. I have, um, I mean, uh, as a result of having written it, I've probably read it more than most people will ever in a lifetime read it, but, um, but that doesn't mean that I understand it any better necessarily. And then I learn always, you know, one of the pleasures, in fact, of going out on these tours and, is, is that be, and meeting people who respond to the work is that I learn from that too, uh, what's going on. I mean, a, a writer really, uh, who knows what he or she is doing doesn't know very much. Uh, and you don't really want to know what you're doing. I mean, when I was very young and I was beginning my 20s and I was starting to write, I didn't know what the hell I was doing. And I didn't know that that was a good thing. Uh, but it let me try everything, and it let me keep on being interested all the time in what I was doing because I didn't know where it was going to go and what mystery I was going to penetrate in the course of writing that, whatever it was, story, poem, play, novel. Um, as I've gotten older, of course, it gets harder and harder not to know what I'm doing, and so I have to um, become more aggressive about that so that I can set up a um, situation where I don't know what I'm doing. And good, but that's a necessity. Why did I decide to end it there? It seemed there was no further place to go. Everything was implied in that last uh, scene, I, I thought. I didn't think there was anything further to say. I, I wanted to move down to Betty's, move out of the story to Betty's point of view, the bottom of the hill, looking back up. And I used the word uh, the couple very pointedly, that she looks up and sees a couple for the first time. And um, so Howard is connected somehow for the first time to another human being. And that's all I wanted to do is to sort of, in a sense, pull the camera back out and let us see him in a way we haven't seen him up to this moment. He looked, at, looked different to us at the very end. <laughs> yeah, I very much have a visual image. In fact, I, I, if I believe that before all else, I want my reader to see and I want myself to see what I'm writing. If I can't see what it is I'm writing, then I think there's a problem between me and the writing, and uh, I'm, I'm avoiding something, uh, or I'm afraid of something, I'm hiding from something, or I'm hiding it from me. And um, so I always want the reader to see. This is something Joseph Conrad said. He said, above all else, I want my readers to see. And also, I might add, and to hear. I mean, when, when people, when characters speak, you want to hear their voices. You, it's auditory hallucination. You want visual and auditory hallucinations in a coordinated comprehensible unfolding drama, but it's out of the body travel. <laughs> um, oh yes, here you are. Uh, oh, um, I, I heard you work with Ann Patchett, that you were her mentor. What was it like to work with her? Oh, Ann Patchett, yes. She's on the road too right now, and she's been telling this story, and it's been coming, filtering back to me. She said, oh yeah, right, my teacher, Russell Banks, and, I, and then a number of people have asked me. So I thank her for that. She's a dear person, and a wonderful writer, of course, as you know. Uh, Ann was a student of mine for just one year, uh, her senior year at uh, Sarah Lawrence, and I was teaching there at the time. And um, I thought she was one of the most gifted writers I had ever read. You know, she was like 22 years old. And, um, and she brought this work in, and I couldn't believe um, that it was um, the work of a 22-year-old who, you know, and she was modest about it, and, uh, and in fact was too modest about it, and um, was riding on her gifts, and they were extraordinary. And I think our, the year we spent together, my main point with her was like, you got that, don't worry about it. Now you have to worry about your, um, your own personal vision of the world and find a way to connect the two, these gifts that you have and your vision of the world. 
And that's, that's what you're going to have to work with for the rest of your writing life. She was already that advanced. She was a remarkable, remarkable young woman. And she's uh, become, you know, I think almost predictably a remarkable writer. And a very nice person, too, who runs a very good bookstore <laughs> in Nashville, where I just was, yeah. I enjoyed Cloud Splitter very much. And I, I remember reading once, I believe, that Martin Scorsese was going to uh, produce an HBO mm. movie, a Cloud Splitter movie, but yeah. I've never seen that movie, so Neither I was just wondering. <laughs> 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 is, there, is, is there a Cloud Splitter movie still in the works? Well, you know, there is and there isn't. I mean, it's in, in always the case in these matters. Um, Scorsese loved it, and he wanted to make it, and he didn't want to direct it. He wanted to produce it. Um, and he attached himself to it, and the director was uh, going to be a man named Raoul Peck, who's a French Haitian director based in Paris, and a, and a wonderful director that HBO was working with on another project. And I was going to write it, and all that happened up to a point. Uh, HBO spent an enormous amount of money in development for that um, project, for me to write it, and for the options, and for Scorsese's fees, and. Um, Pex fees and so forth over a period of several years. The executive who was driving the project forward in the HBO bureau bureaucracy and corporate structure um, eventually at one point left to go to work for Disney. Now when in that kind of a corporate structure when the executive whose project it is leaves um, and whose career and advancement in within the corporation sort of depended upon that project's coming to fruition and success or failure and so on identifies herself and her career as a, to be a woman, uh, leaves, um, then who is going to pick that up and run with it? You know, it's very rare that that happens. And so it, it dro it's dropped. Even though the amount of, you know, they could write off the, lo the, the losses on that um, very, very quickly and not, not think about it. So, so it dropped. And then, you know, every now and then someone will call me up and say, we'd like to develop this for this, this, or that, and so on. And most recently is... Uh, Will Smith's company was, you know, wants to develop it as a series for the History Channel, which is trying to develop content for narratives and so on. So we'll see. I mean, it's, these things go through years and years and years of, of circles and circles. Right. Someone else? Yes, hi. Uh, hi. Uh, yeah, I just wanted to ask, um, you mentioned that this story that you read was uh, based on, like, something that you saw. Um, mm. So I was wondering, like, how frequently is it that stories come into your head or whatever you decide to base a story on something that you heard about or like experienced or like saw or whatever? Well, it seems to happen frequently. I mean, I don't always write them. It may take years before I get around to actually writing the story, but I do keep a notebook like most writers do and, and carry it around with me and make little jottings for things that happen to be interesting to me at that moment with no real idea of where they're going to go. Um, I'll give you one I just wrote yesterday. I have no idea if this, what this is going to turn out to be. Maybe two years or five years from now, it'll, it'll make a story. I wrote this down on the 16th in Boston. It's this funny, ridiculous episode in which I end up assisting a street entertainer to juggle on a unicycle. This happened to me. His method of selection, which I thought was interesting, he took the whole crowd, hands up, everyone, then he says, everyone under 25, hands down. Everyone over 75, hands down. All women, hands down. Until there were only three big, strong men left. And then I said, this is really interesting. The, 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 the lottery, almost, uh, of <laughs> reducing this crowd to three men. And then he got the three men to hold this unicycle, which was one of these tiny, you know, 10 feet high unicycles that he, so he could jump up onto the shoulders and then onto the unicycle and then start juggling um, razor sharp machetes. <laughs> and then we had to let go while he did this. It was a hilarious and ridiculous episode. I was, I was with my godson who's nine years old. And for him, it was the most adventurous and exciting thing. And you know, he had his iPhone out of course and he filmed the entire episode. It, and uh, anyhow, I, so that's in here. Now, uh, that may be a story a few years from now where some kind of, you know, staid man who doesn't expect it is on his way to lunch and he gets sort of pulled into this crowd and he ends up holding a unicycle and, and then because of some weird lottery that, you know, I don't know, these are nice, interesting little elements that might make a story. Someday. So it sort of evolves that way. Okay, well, thank you. You're welcome. <laughs> Yes, one more, is it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
Yeah. That has a, 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 it was in 1982, I was in Concord, New Hampshire, living there, nearby, I was living in the city, and I was working in the library researching what I thought would be a novel, a uh, historical novel, and I was having problems with the material, I wasn't all that interested in it really, and um, I was reading the New York Times, and um, <coughs> to avoid writing actually, and um, and I saw a photograph on the front of it of um, a black bodies rolling up on the beach of Palm on Palm Beach, um, Florida. And I know South Florida pretty well. By then, I, I had spent a lot of time down there over the years. And it, and the story in the paper was of a white American um, boatman uh, who had been smuggling Haitians into South Florida, and he had been accosted by the Coast Guard, and he had forced the Haitians off the boat within sight of the shore. But like most islanders, they couldn't swim, and so they drowned. Um, there were one or two that survived. Anyhow, I knew how a white American man could end up in that situation in 1982, in debt, owing too much money on his house, his family in trouble, one thing or the other, a working class guy who'd gone there to start his life over. I also knew, because I'd lived in the Caribbean and I'd traveled widely there, and I knew how a Haitian woman could put herself and her child in such circumstances in the hands of a man like that uh, in order to escape from the, her, uh, her desperate circumstances. And so it really, I, I saw us instantly at once, both stories, and I knew they were deeply related. I didn't know is that the story, I thought the story was of about 1982. I didn't realize it was about 2013, but it is. I was just in Geneva, uh, Switzerland, um, in early October for a, a little festival and so forth. And um, when boats were going down, that were um, smugglers' boats were going down in the Mediterranean, carrying Africans across into into Western Europe, and in great numbers. And every I, I did about ten interviews or so during that week. And all they wanted to talk about was continental drift. They all thought, "Oh, this story is not about America. It's not about South Florida. Not about Haiti. It's about the world." And I had no idea, of course, at the time. For me, it was strictly about Florida, Haiti, American dream, guy trying to start over and screwing up and not being able to do it, um, and so on. Or a woman coming north trying to get a piece of that American dream and sacrificing everything in order to do it. Uh, but in fact, it's, you know, it's, it's a story of our time. Um, the indebtedness of Bob Du Bois in that novel uh, where he loses his house and he, gets, he goes down and down and down, you know, um, starts out as an oil burner repair man in New Hampshire, and he ends up deeply in debt with the, you know, smuggling in, in South Florida. This is not an, uh, a complicated or unusual story. I live in South Florida six months a year, and I know these stories all the time are showing up. And and so, you know, it's this. This is not a great comment on our on our world. You know, it's just that is that here we are, 25, 28 years later, and it's the same, only worse. You know. Thanks for asking, though. And yeah, and thank you all too for this evening. And it's kind of thank you. Really appreciate it.